This is Space Time, Series 26, Episode 6. Coming up on Space Time, a massive blast in the volcanic moon Io, how the sun's activity influences deep space cosmic rays, and Europe's newest advanced weather satellite launched into orbit. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Astronomers have detected a massive eruption on the volcanic Jovian moon Io. The outburst was discovered by the Planetary Science Institute's Io Input Output Observatory near Benson, Arizona. The massive plume began building up in July and continued until December. The facility's been monitoring volcanic activity on Io since 2017. Volcanic eruptions aren't unusual on Io, in fact a commonplace. And the Io Input Output Observatory's observations have shown some sort of major outburst nearly every year. But the late 2022 event was the biggest by far. Io is the innermost of Jupiter's four large Galilean moons. The others are Europa, Ganymede and Callisto. What makes Io special is that it's the most volcanic world in our solar system, thanks to the gravitational tidal stresses it feels as it's constantly squeezed and stretched by Jupiter and two of its large siblings, Europa and Ganymede. The Io Input Output Observatory uses a chronographic technique which dims the light coming from Jupiter to enable imaging of the faint gases near the planet. The brightening of two of these gases, sodium and ionized sulfur, began between July and September 2022 and lasted through until December. The ionized sulfur forms a donut-like structure that encircles Jupiter, known as an ion plasma torus. But curiously, it wasn't anywhere near as bright during this latest outburst as had previously been seen. One of the study's authors, Jeff Morgenthaler from the Planetary Science Institute, says it could be saying something about the composition of the volcanic activity that produced the eruption. Or it could be that the torus was more efficient at ridding itself of material when more material was thrown into it. The observations have profound implications for NASA's Juno mission, which has been orbiting Jupiter since 2016. Juno flew past Europa during the start of the outburst and is now gradually approaching Io for a close encounter in December. Several of Juno's instruments are sensitive to changes in the plasma environment around Jupiter and Io, and that can be traced directly to the type of volcanic activity being observed by the Io Input-Output Observatory. Morgenthaler says Juno's measurements should be able to tell whether this volcanic outburst had a different composition to previous events. In addition to observing the Jovian sodium nebula, the Io Input Output Observatory also observes Mercury's sodium tail, as well as bright comets and even transiting exoplanets. This is space time. Still to come, how the Sun's activity influences deep space cosmic rays and Europe's newest advanced weather satellite launches into space. All that and more still to come on Space Time. Astronomers have discovered how changes in the Sun's 11-year solar cycle affect the ability of high-energy cosmic rays to reach the inner solar system. The measurements taken by the European Space Agency's Mars and Venus Express missions were able to capture the dance between the high-energy cosmic rays and the influence of the Sun's activity across the inner planets. High-energy cosmic rays are subatomic particles travelling at almost the speed of light which originate from outside our solar system. They're thought to be caused by things like supernova explosions and black holes. And they're a dangerous form of high-energy radiation, capable of causing electronic failures in spacecraft and damage to DNA in people. The new findings, reported in the Astrophysical Journal, show that data from the Espera Plasma Sensor, an instrument carried by both the Mars Express and Venus Express spacecraft, when compared with sunspots visible on the surface of the Sun, show that cosmic ray counts are being suppressed during peaks of activity in the 11-year solar cycle. As well as the decade-long relationship with the solar cycle, the authors also looked at how cosmic ray detections would vary over the shorter time scale of a single planetary orbit. Surprisingly, they found the area protected from cosmic rays behind the planet Mars was almost 100 kilometres wider than the planet's actual radius. The cause of why this blocked area should be so large isn't yet clear. 
The study's lead author, Yoshifumi Futana from the Swedish Institute of Space Physics, says the study shows a range of valuable insights can be derived from what's actually nothing more than background count information collected by the Espera instruments. Futana says understanding the various relationships between cosmic rays and the solar cycle, the atmospheres of the planets, and the performance of spacecraft instrumentation will be important for both future robotic missions as well as human exploration. Launched back in 2003, Mars Express remains in service around the Red Planet, while Venus Express operated from 2006 to 2014. Futana and colleagues compared the 17-year data set from Mars Express, the 8-year data set from Venus Express, as well as Earth-bound cosmic ray measurements from the Thule Neutron Monitoring Greenland. The authors took median value cosmic ray counts over three-month periods in order to minimise the influence of sporadic solar activity such as cosmic rays and coronal mass ejections. The database of cosmic ray radiation counts showed a distinct decrease in the number of cosmic ray detections at the peak of activity for solar cycle 24. The Mars Express data and the observations from Thule on Earth showed very similar features. However, there was an apparent lag of around nine months between the maximum number of sunspots and the maximum cosmic ray detections at Mars. That matches up with previous studies, which had already suggested that there may be a delay of several months between solar activity and the behaviour of cosmic rays at Earth and Mars. Fatana says these new results appear to confirm this, and they also provide evidence that solar cycle 24 was a bit unusual, perhaps due to the long solar minimum between cycles 23 and 24, or the relatively low activity during cycle 24. The analysis of the Venus Express data was more complicated because of changes in the way onboard processing was carried out after 2010. Also, while the Espera instruments carried on both Mars and Venus Express missions were based on a common design, they were each tailored for the very different planetary environments in which they operated. This means that a direct comparison of cosmic ray fluxes at Mars and Venus wasn't possible using the available database. The idea of using background counts to study the interaction between cosmic rays and high-energy particles with planetary missions is relatively new. But Fatana says obtaining this information shows potential as a powerful new tool for the upcoming Jupiter Icy Moon Explorer or JUICE mission, which will study the harsh environment around Jupiter's icy moons. Uh, my scientific philosophy is that and I would try to answer a question that people never even thought about it. This paper is really aligned to my philosophy that and, uh, people never take it take a noise data seriously, but we did it and successfully extracted an information about an valuable science. The fascinating part of this study is we used an, a noise data from our instrument on Mars and Venus that were built uh, at the, the Swedish Institute of Space Physics here in Kiruna. Noise data was considered as a garbage or junk so that no one has seriously looked at this data. And we developed an algorithm to extract and graphic cosmic ray information from noise data. And we have successfully done it. Uh, galactic cosmic ray is an important uh, cause, um, uh, it can cause an, uh, uh, instrument errors in the space system as well as it destroys the DNAs of human bodies. It's a threat uh, for the future exploration in space or, or the human activity in space. That's Yoshifumi Futana from the Swedish Institute of Space Physics. And this is Space Time. Still to come, Europe's newest advanced weather satellite takes to the skies, and later in the science report, a new study shows that Australians aren't very good at guessing how much alcohol they've had to drink during a big night out. All that and more coming up on Space Time. The European Space Agency has successfully launched its first Mediasat third-generation imager satellite, the MTGI-1, into geostationary orbit. 
The spacecraft was flown aboard an Ariane 5 rocket from ESA's Kourou spaceport in French Guiana. Six, cinq, quatre, trois, deux, un, top. Allumage Vulcain, allumage des EAP décollage, la propulsion est nominale. And we are off. How wonderful to see the mighty Ariane roaring across that equatorial sky. Definitely a launch to savor. We are now over one minute into the flight as she powers her way into space, heading east out over the Atlantic Ocean. It's hard to get tired of it, right? <laughs> it's amazing. Look at this. Yeah. Uh, I might be an engineer, but still, I, I have emotions when I see that. Right. No, that's, uh, that's amazing. I'm like a ball of fire oh, thrusting yeah. itself. Into no, and, and we are extremely Look lucky because uh, we can clearly see uh, the, the rocket like blasting its, its way towards Raphael, space. Raphael, what do you have to tell us? Well, I mean, everything is going to happen quite quick, quickly now. Uh, you'll have uh, in a few seconds the booster separations. That's uh, the first thing have, we have to look out for. Yeah, they will have provided 90% of the overall thrust in order to literally escape the gravity pull of the Earth. And then you will have the separation of the fairing when we have crossed the limits of the atmosphere. It's protected the satellite from the friction of the air, but also from the noise uh, generated at the booster's ignition. And then we will have the separation of the main cry cryogenic stage. And here, oh, here you we can go. see and the yes. booster separation. Yes. So it's confirmed by the DDO. So, um, Mathieu, without these two boosters, the launcher is obviously now a lot lighter. So, um, than it was at takeoff. Its load has been lightened uh, by how many tons and why is this necessary, well, even it, essential? Does was, lighter mean faster? Yeah, yeah, it was 775 tons on the launch pad. Ah. Now, now it's about 156 tons because we got rid of, of these empty boosters. I ima imagine that we managed to, uh, to get rid of about 500 tons of propellant in about two, uh, two minutes and 20 seconds. But this is uh, the amount of energy that you need uh, to, to go to space. From its perch, some 36,000 kilometres above the equator, this new all-weather satellite will provide state-of-the-art observations of Earth's atmosphere, as well as real-time monitoring of lightning events, providing crucial observations for the early detection and prediction of fast-moving severe storms, weather forecasting and climate monitoring. Built by Thales Alenia Space, the satellite carries two completely new instruments, Europe's first lightning imager and a flexible combined imager. The lightning imager will capture individual lightning events in all weather conditions day and night. It's the first time a geostationary weather satellite will have the capability of detecting lightning across Europe and Africa as well as the surrounding waters. MTGI-1 will continuously monitor more than 80% of the Earth's surface for lightning discharges taking place either between clouds or between clouds and the ground or sea. The flexible combined imager uses two scanning services to build up a picture of fast-moving storm events, scanning the entire hemisphere every 2.5 to 10 minutes across 16 different spectral bands. The data acquired will provide information about everything from clouds to water vapour to oceans, even to local wildfire events. These images will enable earlier prediction of severe weather events and improvements to forecasts. The new spacecraft will also carry two smaller payloads, designed for data collection from remote science beacons and for search and rescue operations by detecting emergency beacons. MTGI-1 is the first of six satellites that will eventually provide the full MTG constellation, providing weather forecasting data over the next 20 years. In full operation, the mission will comprise two MTGI satellites and one MTGS or sounding satellite working in tandem. As well as the Meteosat third generation imager satellite, the flight also carried Intelsat's Galaxy 35 and Galaxy 36 telecommunications satellites. This is Space Time. That's the show for now. Space Time is available every Monday, Wednesday and Friday through Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, Spotify, Acast, Amazon Music, Bytes.com, SoundCloud, YouTube, your favourite podcast download provider and from spacetimewithstuartgary.com. Space Time's also broadcast through the National Science Foundation on Science Zone Radio 
and on both iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. And you can help to support our show by visiting the Spacetime store for a range of promotional merchandising goodies. Or by becoming a Spacetime patron, which gives you access to triple episode commercial free versions of the show, as well as lots of bonus audio content which doesn't go to air, access to our exclusive Facebook group and other rewards. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.com for full details. And if you want more space time, please check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as heaps of images, news stories, loads of videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, through our Spacetime YouTube channel. And on Facebook, just go to facebook.com forward slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. And Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 